Hello YouTube, this is Chris with Task Force 247 Airsoft, sponsored by Fox Airsoft, located in Parker, Colorado. And today I'm going to be doing a full review of all of the gear in my newly acquired Spetsnaz GRU loadout. Uh, a lot of these things are very hard to come by, and I've finally been able to put them all together and get the loadout that I've been wanting for a while. So without further ado, let's get started. The Afghan era Lifshik rig, Burka mountain suit, my personal belt rig for things that the lift shit cannot accommodate. Three types of headwear. And last but not least, the weapons. Alright, so first up we're going to start with the Gorka Mountain Suit. Right now I have on the pants which feature elastic waist and very comfortable elastic suspenders. The pattern is an off color of OD and tan with uh, brown patches to add some distortion to the silhouette. Uh, Gorka does come in a variety of colors and patterns. Usually the color of the OD slash tan stays consistent and then the brown will change color to SS Partisan, regular Partisan, all different sorts of Russian pattern. And now with the Gorka top on you can see that the same pattern repeats across the top, the pocket liners and all this. Uh, one thing I do enjoy that the pockets themselves are internal and not sewn onto the outside so you have no chance of snagging your pocket and to close it the entire pocket itself folds over so there's no sneaking through the cargo gap as most people have found out in their first starter days of airsoft that happens a lot if you jam stuff in cargo pockets that doesn't happen in these they have two smaller velcro pockets on the shoulders and the thing I do enjoy the most about Gorka is it has a hood for weather sniper veil whatever you need uh, you can fit a uh, good sized helmet under these. They have a little duck bill to give you a sunshade. And uh, a lot of the complaints I hear about Russian kits is that the Gorka is really baggy. It's supposed to be. It is an oversuit for your uniform. So usually on a typical day you'd wear your Afghanka or Partisan BDUs underneath these and this would be an oversuit for travel. Uh, they do work fantastic in Colorado as mountain camouflage, hence Gorka Mountain Camo. Uh, one other thing about it, that if uh, you are looking for Gorka, there's three different manufacturers that make real Gorka. There's ANA, Splav, and Sposen. Sposen is the one to get. get. This is Sposen. It's extremely expensive, but it's high quality. This Gorka Mountain Camo costs about $200, but... Uh, Sposen is the Russian equivalent of cry, so, you know, pick your poison. Now moving on to headwear. For hotter summer months, there's a very thin, uh, not very, mi kind of micro fleece, very thin layered balaclava that they wear. Uh, besides Russia being cold as hell, what they, the, the idea behind covering the faces of those troops entirely is it breaks away that emotional response if one of them gets shot. You can't identify who is who, therefore the mission success rate will be higher if emotions don't get in the way. And I know to a lot of you uh, former military guys watching this, and the whole no man left behind, that seems very strange to you. But it works with the Russians, and that's why one of their, they're one of the most deadly fighting forces on the world. Uh, for casual wear and, you know, not really needing to, for basic troop movement or anything, just basic headgear to help break the silhouette, we have the Vimple Bandana, which is basically the Russian equivalent of the Shamog. Uh, it's a lot smaller than the Shamog, it's mainly just a headwear or a quick wrap scarf. Same similar functions as the Shamog, you just can't wrap it all the fancy ways. It's either bandana or scarf. And then, for winter, you guessed it. A thicker, regular type ski mask balaclava keeps good insulation. Put up the hood, breaks the silhouette very well, etc. Now let's move on to the belt. All right, now that the belt is on, we're starting to see less bagginess with the Gorka, and things are coming along better here on the left side. Uh, keep in mind that. The belt itself is just thrown together by me. It doesn't match any Russian specification. It's just something I needed to add that the lift shik rig could not accommodate. Uh, on the right here, I have a Soviet era, early Soviet era, uh, double AK pouch. I removed the middle divider so now I can fit four AK pouches. 
I mainly use this to store high caps that I need in case I run out, uh, buddy mags, things like that. It has an outer pocket for a grenade and an outer pocket for a pistol. Uh, right behind that I have my dump bag, nothing too big right there. And here I have an open top, well velcro top, uh, holster for, the U for my USP-45. Closest thing I could ever I could get to an MP443 Grok. Uh, the pistols handle similar characteristics and similar build quality such as that. Uh, I don't want to do drop legs or anything until I get the appropriate drop leg. This is kind of just a, I don't know what holster they use yet or where to source one, so this will work. Then right here I have my entrenching tool that also includes a saw blade, a spearhead, and a hatchet. So that's a good little tool to have that kind of adds to the, you know, illegality of the specimens carrying a lot of miscellaneous things that most people don't think they need. Now let's move on to the lift shick rig. All right, so now the lift shick, the belt, the gorka, the vimple, it is all on, and the rig is starting to look beefier, more what you expect from specimens. Uh, the lift shick rig is an outdated rig in my opinion, but as far as Vietnam style rigs, you know, three mag pouches, four utilities go, uh, this one is very superior to a lot of them. Uh, Russians, just like they realized the advancement for optics in the early 70s when they built the optic side mount rail on their AK uh, before any other weapon system had it, they, had, they showed the same uh, ingenuity here when creating the lift shake. If you can see, the shoulder pads have a type of molly webbing on them, very thick molly. Right, it's like two inches apart, which is a little thicker, well double the size of most molly webbing. Uh, but there I have my Elite Force dead rag tied on, my radio pouch, and underneath I have my knife. So that does add a little bit of real estate. Uh, the main features of this are the three double AK pouches. Uh, they have the traditional Soviet era brass buckle and leather snap. Right here we carry on uh, the utility pouches small survival tool with a compass, thermometer, humidity uh, readout, uh, survival mirror, things like that. Underneath that, got the vodka. Gotta have that in a Russian kit, no exception. Uh, over here, I carry an ICS 40 millimeter and a Lancer Tactical 40 millimeter. Uh, these Lancer shells are very good. I'm, I plan on doing a review of them very soon. Uh, they're very cheap. They're about thirty dollars, and they're more powerful than most shells that I've used. So on the left side and right side, you have this little sling mount for a flare. And on this side, you see it being used for a flashlight. So uh, this rig can hold a lot for what it is, and I'm very impressed by that. Let's move on to the weapons. All right, let's conclude this with going through my weapons that I am primarily using. First off, we have an LCT AKS-74U with a real steel PSO-1 scope. Uh, I use this primarily as a marksman rifle. Uh, LCT makes the best in AK lines by far. And obviously, this thing can handle going up against DMRs right out of the box. Uh, it looks very good with the age of the kit. And it's just a badass gun in general. Uh, moving on to when I need something a little more modern. I am using this to turn into a CQV gun. This is an LCT AK-104. Uh, three position train stock, side mount rail, shorter barrel in between the AK-74 and the AK-74U. Uh, the Black Hawk vertical grip and a 900 my bad, 190 lumen strobe. So this rifle is very small, gives good compact space inside of a CQB environment, and once I dull the FPS down, this thing will be ready to rock the new APC uh, field in Denver. And now for the piece of the resistance, we have my modified Matrix RPG-7B. Uh, the warhead comes out, it's a dummy, you put a 40 millimeter shell down the barrel and pull uh, in combination with the Matrix, uh, not Matrix, my bad, the Milsim Labs foam slugs. This thing's a beast. Uh, one issue I ran into for any rocket owners out there, uh, when it was slung sideways across my back, 
I would always knock the warhead off and break the glue seal holding it together. So what I did is I took two slings on it and slap it on like a backpack. So now it runs straight up and down my back and it will not get caught going through a doorway. It's perfect level. It's just under seven feet so you can move through a doorway, not have to worry. And that's about it. So I'd love to stay here and chat a little longer, but I think I got some things to do. This is Chris with Task Force 247 Airsoft, signing out.